how do we increase the mobility of the qua in our like groin, hip, pelvis area, as well as the yao, which is in that waist and torso area. These are the two areas that really limit mobility. And the more we can improve the range of these areas, the more it will not only help our Tai Chi and our Qigong and our internal arts, but just mobility in general, how well we move, because this is the central like fulcrum of our body's movements. And the any limitations here really limit our ability to move move and leads actually to a lot of injuries because a lot of people they think that when they get injured it's due to the problem at the site of the injury like if you have knee issues you a lot of people think that it's a problem with their knees but a lot of the case, it's not actually the knees that are the problem. It's a lack of mobility up in this area that prevents you from getting into the proper position for your knees. And so the knees winds up being the victim of limited mobility in the other areas. Like if you had the range to actually allow the knee to get into position, then the knee wouldn't get injured. And especially, you know, a lot of people, they take Tai Chi because they have heard that it's good for arthritis and it's good for your knees. And then that's why they take Tai Chi because they already have some sort of problem that they're trying to recover from. But when Tai Chi isn't done, in the proper alignment, it will make the knee problem worse. And it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. Qua is so important to helping prevent knee pain when you're doing Tai Chi. And I am the queen of knee injuries. I, I have had three ACL surgeries. I've had two on my right knee, one on my left knee. And just making sure people understand the alignment is so important. And the quad plays a big role in this. So we have different anatomy terminology in our Chinese anatomy and our Western anatomy. And the term kua and yao are Chinese terms. And they are translated into English terms using English, like Western concepts of anatomy. But they are not a one-for-one -one translation. The qua is this area that in Western anatomy covers the groin as well as the pelvis and the hip and a little bit of that upper thigh as well as the lower abdominals. So it's this entire area here that basically connects your legs to your hips and torso. And it is a large, large area. So when you think groin, you just think of this intersection here. But then we also have the pelvis and the hips. You also have like the, the, the back end like where the back connects to the front, which, you know, kind of connects to your glutes, as well as these lower abdominal muscles that m many, many people um, have a lot of weakness in the inner lower abdominal muscles. Uh, and especially for women, because these are the muscles that become very, very weak when we get pregnant. And these are the muscles that wind up getting weak and it's very hard to strengthen back up afterwards. But even men and women, these muscles get really weak because we're in bad posture and our sitting positions every day don't work these muscles. So it, there's just this 
great weakness that happens in this whole area. So when we say kwa, you think groin, but it's more than groin. And the other area that we're going to talk about today is yao. Yao is usually translated in English as waste. So you'll hear a lot, especially when you read about Tai Chi, that your yao controls the movements. And that translates over to English as your waist controls the movements. But what yao represents in Chinese and what waist represents in English are kind of different. So when I think of waist and how it's normally used in English, it's your waist line. It's this area here, the part that you measure when you go get fitted for clothing, and it's like this section that kind of comes in the most. And when you think of waistline, um, you think of the circumference of that waistline because usually that's when you're talking about your your waist is usually if you're talking about waist it's about the waistline and you're measuring it and so when you're measuring your waist what will affect that measurement is the front when you when you gain weight you add weight to the front of the body, and this is the area that affects your waistline. And so I think like when you think about waist in English, you're thinking about kind of like this area as well as the front area. The Chinese yao is actually referring more to the back area of the, your, your, your waist. And it's a bigger area than just this one area where you would be measuring the waistline. The yao is basically your torso. It's like this larger section that is above the hips. So the whole section up here would be the yao. And there's this phrase that Chinese people will use call and you might hear people after they did some you know heavy lifting or if they did like exercise or they just had a really hard day of like manual labor they will use a phrase called yao shuan bei tong yao shuan means a sore waist bei tong means um I, you know a painful back. So after you do like hard labor, like maybe shoveling or lifting heavy things, then you know, say yao suan bei tong, and then they will use their hands. And when they are trying to um, alleviate the soreness of their yao, they hit back here. So, like this is kind of where. The Chinese yao is, is focused on is more in the back area. And then if they say bei tong, then, you know, they're going to be like hitting like, you know, back up here. So it's a different area of focus. And if you kind of translate that into your Tai Chi practice, this would make sense because this is where you have the most limited mobility. It is in your back area. So when you hear about yao, it, it's this whole section that includes this back area. And this is very stiff. So the two areas in Western society that becomes the most stiff are that back and the this qua area. I read a really interesting thesis. And I don't know how valid it is, but I found it super, super interesting that looked at 
when Western society's health kind of started going down. And his thesis is you can map that to the popularity of the Western toilet. That when the Western toilet became popular, it wound up limiting the mobility for Western society. And this, for me, makes a lot of sense because if you go over to Asia and other areas where you have a lot, where, you know, the Western toilet isn't so popular yet, what you find, the position that a lot of people are in, uh, they're squatting. And squatting is actually a position that has almost been completely eliminated from Western society. You know, so like, it, and even I, like I spent my youth in Taiwan and we weren't using Western toilets we were squatting to use the bathroom and that ability to come down into a squat that gives us the mobility habit in this area that we um that that then develops these lower abdominal muscles, you know, it keeps our hips and pelvis strong and all of these, you can't really activate and develop those muscles without going down there. And if you don't go down there, then you don't get to, you know, utilize it. So like squatting is a position that is really, really difficult for folks that um, are, you know, in like the Western society habits. Like I think it does show that limiting your range has a use it or lose it effect. And you will hear this from physical therapists a lot that one of the biggest problems in helping people who are dealing with arthritis or any other kind of joint pain is the pain stops them from moving. And when you stop moving, then you wind up losing the ability to move that part because our bodies need to be moving in order to lubricate. And once you stop moving, you actually stop the lubrication and then that makes everything worse. So like the worst thing, if you're dealing with you know, some sort of joint inflammation is if you stop moving, you actually make it worse. So, you know, these are the little things that we have to do to keep ourselves being able to move as we get older. It gets harder to get everything open. Right? There, the weaknesses and the atrophy causes things to kind of turn in. And we need to do things to open it up so that we can get that mobility again. And, it's, and it has to be constant. In order to get these to be open in our adult life, we have to just be constantly trying to keep it open because if we don't, then it's going to collapse, right? So that's what we, we need to do. And the thing that I like to think about is like mindfully place a ball inside your pelvis. Like imagine that a ball lives inside your pelvis and this ball, and when the ball inflates, it pushes everything inside to be more open. And sometimes it can't open up very much because we're very tight. But 
it still can open up a little bit to push everything out around a little bit. And then when you're able to get that pushed out, like just maintain that as much as you can so that this is always there. Right? If you are able to have a sense of opening, like if a ball really did live here in your pelvis and it inflated out, then there's a support right here, like in your, and it's not really so much the groin, but like this upper thigh area has a support that will open out. And when this right below the groin, this upper thigh can open up, it now supports your knees. Otherwise, the knees will collapse in. But if you try to push the knees out, then it's going against a force. Like you're, the collapse is stronger than your ability to overcome the collapse with your own effort. Like this area, the core, these are the areas everyone can strengthen. Like this is the area of the body that can be the strongest and your qua mobility and your yao like strength go together like they're a pair so the stronger you can make your yao the easier it will be to also open up your qua because then these two stitch together so what we want is to Think about strength in this area a little bit different. The way I like to explain it is like what we want to do is it's like stitching together tapestry from like our entire torso. It's like a whole sheet that forms, that is strong, that attaches our torso all over to the hips, to the qua, and all of this becomes one integrated sheet around. Like if you are watching TV, if you are, you know, just, just doing anything where you could be sitting, you could be standing. If you take half of the time that you spent sitting, standing, there's actually going to be a huge benefit right there because not only are you going to be strengthening up your legs, you're going to get an awareness of your body's alignment. And you know, so there's a particular standing though. It's not just any kind of standing. There's a particular standing that can help. And this is in basically in our tree pose standing meditation that we do. This, if you can incorporate this into your daily habits of standing, it will help tremendously. And if your lower back is really tense, and stiff, then you can't expand this torso. It winds up actually just completely disconnecting the upper body from the lower body. But we really want this sense that on the inside, it becomes hollow. Like we have to let go of the inside so that everything on the outside expands and then can stitch together. The goal is to increase the strength that you need for your Tai Chi, then like do more of that Tai Chi. And, you know, one way is, you know, to do some stance work to then like strengthen. Like if you're doing other exercises to try to strengthen, um, parts of the body that will help support you to be in this position better you could just 
spend that time in this position for longer to do this position better. <laughs> and that kind of like cuts out the middleman, right? So this is stance work. So both stands, you just settle and stay in this position. And then you feel that support, relax into it. See, like, where are your feet? Like, where, uh, where's your weighting in your feet? Is it even? Like, are you open? Can you relax? Where's your body position? And, you know, stay in this and relaxing into this position to open up that quad, right? On the one side, as well as the other side, you'll notice that you have limitations one side versus the other side, that you might have more problems and then you have to adjust. You might need to have a smaller stance on one side because you have more limited you know, mobility and this understanding of your body in your Tai Chi is so crucial, right? The more you are in tune with your own body's limitations in your Tai Chi, the better you can adjust for that in your Tai Chi. So, you know, that's the same thing. Just if you have to take a smaller stance, everything still has to have that same alignment. And just because it's a smaller stance, it shouldn't feel less engaged. Like, at any distance, equally engaged. It shouldn't be like, this is when I'm stepping wide, this is when I'm feeling it. And then when I'm stepping a little bit, now this is easy, I'm not feeling anything. Like, even in the smallest step, there's should feel just as much engagement throughout the whole entire body. Right? You should also feel that stretching out in the qua. There's so much value to being able to stay, like go to the limits of what you can sustain. All right. Still very active and no point of this did we go limp and the feeling that i really do have it's like like there's like a sheet around that gets pulled that like connects everything to it. like if if like somebody were able to like <laughs> take come into my whole fascia and lift it up and move me that's how i move All right. okay so Yao Kwa, they work together. They um, really shouldn't be seen as very different things. They, they really do support each other. The sh like if you only work on one, but the other is weak, I mean, that's, it's better than having both weak, but you still won't be able to have the mobility that you'll have if you work on both and think of them not so much as separate things, but you know, the two parts that come together into a whole, right? You, you need the Yao to work with the Kwa and together like this then can become strong. The stronger you can get this part of the body, then the more you can relax every other part of your body. When you don't feel strong in your central core, then everything else has to make up for that weakness. And this is just... You know, that that's just how it is like because there is a certain amount of physicality required in tai chi like in order for us to actually fully transfer the weight from one leg to another leg and step somewhere and turn and shift and be able to move 
um, it requires a certain amount of physical strength and mobility. And if we can rely on the part that can be strongest and make that actually the strongest, then we can relax around that. And you know, so that's what like we we want to do. And part of it is just in your everyday. Just just in your everyday. Now there are things that you can do in Tai Chi when you want to do exercises, but even more fundamental, and I've said this in other workshops as well, how you sit, how you walk, just the habits that you have in your daily living contribute the most. Sitting, if you're able to sit like this, this also engages your head up, works the lower abdominals and works the qua. This is a challenge um, for a lot of people to sit in this way with your foot flat, but you can start with sitting and opening your feet to whatever is the amount that you can open with the toes up, engaged up. So the important part is keeping this engaged up and the toes up so that you're actually working on these muscles here. And then you can pick up a knee and pick up a knee. And then that starts working on the muscles around your hips and the groins, the lower abdominals while you keep engaged. So this is actually engaging your yaw and your qua by just sitting toes point straight and then just lifting the knee a little bit. Right? And then the, if you can lift a little bit, that's the start of lifting a little bit more. Like if you can lift more, then you can start actually doing this. That really now works those hip muscles, but this again, you have to work up to it. It's a challenge, right? But keeping your body stable and then you can, you know, go and face it, right? So this is actually a stretch that I personally do a lot. I do this. I spend a lot of time holding these positions, doing it for a long time where, you know, the legs spread, toes point up, the hands, I just let it stay flat to the floor and then just slowly bringing the hands forward little by little and holding. I will just stay in each of these positions for at least a minute. So this whole stretching routine will take me quite a bit of time to do. Toes have to stay up and the body has to stay in that straight engaged position, right? So you can like go down and just go like where you can. But then when you come down now, elbow and just stay for a really, really long time. And then I, so I, I walk that forward and then also to the side. So now I go to the side. And I just put the hands down front and back and just hold. Same thing, just walk it. So palms to the ground and wherever is the limit, that's where you stop and just, but you have to hold it for a long time. And this should feel super engaged. Like there's a stretch through the whole body. And I only bend down to be able to keep my hands on the floor. And then if I am going to bend down, the elbows come to the floor. So I'm not like folding over. So this is keeping an engagement like all the way through, all the way. Um, so that that's my own personal stretching routine is I come and I do this going forward. I come to the side, I walk, the elbow comes down. 
making sure that that toe stays up, that we're not collapsed, that that stays up until I get to the front where I keep my elbows on the floor and now I can touch you know, the, the, the foot, right? So that it stays engaged and it feels like the whole sheet stretches, not any internal part, but the whole sheet stretches and it supports like here as well as here because these are all part of the same thing that needs to support. 